So this morning we are wrapping up a series called Rooted, um, and we've been talking for the last nine weeks or so on the topic of what does it look like to grow in our walk with Jesus? What does it look like to mature in our walk with Jesus? Um, how do I know I'm growing? How do I know I'm maturing? And so we've looked at various different topics of how, how do we understand that we're growing? How do we, what are habits that we create? And last week, we looked at the three core habits that we will never outgrow in our spiritual walk with Jesus. No matter how much we grow, no matter how mature we become, we'll never grow beyond building on the three core habits of reading or listening to God's word, praying, and pursuing worship and fellowship within a church community. No spiritual habit matters more than reading or listening to the Bible. Believe that it's worth it. Start small. Pick a format that works for you and good tools that will help you. And if you struggle, enlist support from others. I'm just recapping what we've talked about last week. The second thing we talked about was prayer. Prayer is both easy, it's hard. Nobody ever feels like they're an expert in prayer. Cultivate prayer in your life by managing your life through prayer, by praying at set times throughout the day and praying um, with Scripture. And then pursue fellowship and worship within the church body. You need the ministry of the church, even when it's challenging, even when church is messy, and the church also needs you. These habits seem ordinary, but they lie at the center of our growth with Jesus. We never grow beyond them, right? Um, we never go past them. I've never met someone who's matured and walked in, um, or is walking strongly in their faith that skipped over any of these habits. At the same time, I've, if you find someone that's struggling in their walk with Jesus, usually they're struggling in one of these three areas, if not all three. Each one offers a lifetime of growth. After years of reading the Bible, praying and participating in the life of the church, often we feel like we're still just getting started, that God is still just teaching us something new. These core habits are foundational for our growth. It's easy to get bored with them because they seem so ordinary. They aren't flashy. They're not quick fixes. And we're often tempted to look for novelty rather than the means that God uses to grow us. These core habits, properly understood, are anything but boring when you get into them. They may be mundane and ordinary and at times lack excitement, but they are wondrous or miraculous. They are beautiful ways that we grow in conformity with Jesus and who we are meant to be in our walk, in our life. And when we ignore them, we struggle. And the moment we begin to ignore the core habits is the moment we begin to become stagnant in our walk with Jesus. This morning, I want to dive in a little bit deeper to these core habits and add a few supporting habits that will only strengthen your walk with Jesus. Now listen, for some of you guys, this message today is where you take notes and you store it because what God is calling you right now is to build your core habits of prayer and reading scripture and being in church community. For others of you, these are things that you need to start participating in right now in your life. These are meant to supplement the core habits rather than distract you from these core habits. Some habits are easier than others. And no matter whether we're practicing the core habits or supporting habits, the fundamentals remain the same. Those habits that we talked about a few weeks ago, start small. Use triggers, rewards, focus on progress. Don't focus on perfection. Keep going even when you fail and make the habits work for you. Employ a clean state policy and build consistency, especially with the core habits. And as you become more proficient with those core habits of reading the Bible, praying, and being involved in church community, add these supporting habits. Experiment with the ones that work best for you, and remember to add one at a time so that you don't burn out. So let me give you just a few supporting habits that I think will help us grow and mature in our walk with Jesus. Number one, Practice the Sabbath. Now, let me say this. This week I read a quote that said a preacher should never preach on a topic that he's struggling with. Um, and I think there's some truth to that, but I'll be honest with you. 
many of these things are areas where I struggle with as well. And so this is why we need each other as community. Um, these are not things that I've perfected and am able to share with you. These are areas that I'm still growing in, right? And so first thing, practice the Sabbath. Everyone I know is busy. It's almost become, hey, how are you doing? We're busy, right? I mean, it's not good anymore. It's I'm busy, right? I'm consistently busy. It's almost like if you're not busy, you feel like you're not doing enough. Our work is never ends. We all have this onslaught of tasks and responsibilities, and we feel like we never get things done. And now we carry our work in our pockets and our purses, and it's almost impossible to leave work at work and to get rest when rest is needed. And as a result, we live in this perpetual state of hurry. Dr. Suzanne Coven who practices internal medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital, wrote this. She said, in the past few years, I've, ex I've observed an epidemic of sorts. Patient after patient suffering from the exact same condition. And the symptoms of this condition include fatigue, irritability, insomnia, anxiety, headaches, heartburn, bowel disturbances, back pain, weight gain. There are no blood tests or x-ray diagnosis for this condition, and yet it's easy to recognize. The condition is excessive busyness. And the result isn't just a frantic lifestyle, it's a busy heart. Ultimately, every problem I see and every person I know is a problem of moving too fast for too long in many aspects of their lives. And scripture says that we counter this epidemic with one countercultural but necessary practice, the Sabbath, to rest. Keeping the Sabbath in Scripture is a commandment that is right after or right next to things like don't lie, don't murder, don't commit adultery. By the way, also keep the Sabbath. It's important. Sabbath is a gift from God that we are invited as his followers to receive. Listen to these words in Exodus Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. God worked. We are to work. God rested. Friends, we are to rest. God calls us to rest. The Sabbath calls us to build the doing of nothing into our schedules every week. Nothing measurable is accomplished. And by the world standards, it's inefficient, unproductive, and useless. As one theologian stated, to fail to see the value of simply being with God and doing nothing is to miss the heartbeat of Christianity. To fail to value to value simply being with God and doing nothing is to miss the heartbeat of our faith Sabbath when lived out is our means as the people of God to bear witness to bear witness to the way that we understand life its rhythms its gifts its meaning and ultimate purpose in God when we observe the Sabbath we affirm God is the center and the source of our lives he is the beginning the middle the end of our existence. One of the greatest dangers of Sabbath is legalism. When the Jewish folks returned from exile, something changed along the way that, of how they approached the Sabbath. Instead of the Sabbath being a weekly reminder that God's people were waiting for something more, the Sabbath became a rule that they had to keep. Or more precisely, it became 40 rules that they had to keep according to Jewish writings. It was as if they were wearied from the continual battle of toil and curse that God's people took the easy way out. Rather than hoping and looking for something that was coming, somehow they became so focused on what they were doing now. They became, instead of hoping for what God was doing, they settled for a checklist. Cook the food this way, not that way. Do this, not that. Walk this many miles, not that many miles. The day of rest became a day of more burdens instead of a day delighting in God. But hey, if you make the rules, you can feel good about keeping the rules and look down on those who don't, right? And then this obscure Jewish rabbi from Nazareth upsets 
everything. And he upsets them on the Sabbath, no less. On the Sabbath, his disciples were caught snacking in the grain fields. And the Pharisees rebuke him. And it, Jesus responds to him. He says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, you see Jesus heal with their hands. He fixes backs. He brings wholeness and healing on that sacred day pointing forward. He shreds the rule book of the Jews and yet promises the same rest that Sabbath always represented. And that's the point. What, Sabbath, what the Sabbath represented, Jesus fulfilled. He is Sabbath in human form. Only he can give what the Sabbath was meant to give. And as the Lord of the Sabbath, he says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There's a book that I read recently called The Emotionally Healthy Leader and Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And it shares four principles of biblical Sabbath, which I found to be incredibly helpful to me personally. And here's the first thing. It says stop. Sabbath is first and foremost a day of stopping. To stop is literally built into that Hebrew word Sabbath. Yet most of us can't stop until we're finished with whatever it is that we think we need to do. We need to complete our projects. We need to finish our term papers. We need to answer our emails. We need to return all the phone messages. We need to balance our checkbook. We need to make sure the clothes are washed and put away. There's always one more goal of reaching that needs to be reached before we could stop. And yet on Sabbath, Jesus says, embrace your limits. Realize that you cannot do everything, that God is God, that he is indispensable, that I am his creature, and the world will continue to work fine even when I stop and rest. Friends, you and I, we are called to stop on Sabbath because when we do, we recognize that God is on the throne assuring us that the world will not fall apart if we seize our activities. Life on this side of heaven is this unfinished symphony. We accomplish one goal, and then immediately we're confronted with new opportunities and new challenges. But ultimately, we will die with countless unfinished projects and goals. When we die, there will be things that we still haven't finished. And that's okay. God is at work taking care of the universe. He manages quite well before we showed up, and he will manage quite well before, after we are gone. Psalm 121 says, God never sleeps, that he never rests, that he is constantly watching out for us. The reason you and I can rest, the reason you and I can close our eyes tonight and sleep is because we serve a God who never sleeps, because we serve a God who is constantly watching out for us. Can you imagine if God took a vacation for an hour, right? I mean, it, it may, let's just say a day. We say God just decided that he was just going to turn his back on the earth for a day. Can you imagine the chaos that would happen in that day? The reason you and I can sleep, the reason you and I can rest, the reason you and I can stop, because we serve a God who's never stopping watching over us. He is consistently keeping his eyes on us. He keeps watching over us. When we are sleeping, he is still working. And so he commands us to relax. He commands us to rest, to re enjoy the fact that we are not in charge of his world, that even after we die, the world will continue on nicely without us. Every Sabbath reminds us to be still and know that he is God. Every Sabbath reminds us to stop worrying about tomorrow and all the worries of tomorrow or the day after because your God will provide and take care of you. Friends, when you trust God and obey his commands, he provides. When you follow him, he says he will take care of you. God takes our loaves and our fishes that we offer him, and even though they're insufficient to feed a multitude, somehow he miraculously and invisibly multiplies them. You can trust him enough to rest, to stop. Number two, rest. Once we stop the Sabbath, God, once we stop, the Sabbath calls us to rest. God rested after his work, and he says, you are to do the same. He says, one day of the week, you are to rest. What do we do to replace all that we're doing during our Sabbath time? The answer is simply whatever delights you or replenishes you, whatever refreshes you. When we stop and rest, we respect our humanity and the image of God in us. We are not nonstop humans. Sadly, it often takes a physical illness such as cancer, a heart attack, a flu, or something even more severe to get us to rest. 
And we don't serve the Sabbath. The Sabbath serves us. It calls us to rest. We're to rest. Number three, we're to delight. A third component of biblical Sabbath revolves around delighting in what has been given to us by God. God, after finishing his work on creation, proclaimed it was very good. God delighted over his creation. The Hebrew phrase there, when God delights over creation, communicates a sense of joy, completion, wonder, play. God is just joyful. And there is this particularly radical in a culture like ours that's both secular and Christian is this delight deficiency. We do not delight. We don't enjoy. We don't marvel and delight in the things that God gives us. Because the way pleasure and delight has been distorted by our culture, many of us as Christians struggle with receiving joy and pleasure in life. And yet God says on Sabbaths you are to enjoy and delight in creation and its gifts. You're to slow down and pay attention to things like food, smelling and tasting its riches. We're to take in and see the beauty of a tree, a leaf, the flowers, the sky that God has masterfully created. He has given us the ability to see and touch and taste and smell and hear that we might feast our senses on the miraculousness of life and the beauty of his creation. On Sabbath, God invites us to slow down and pay attention and delight in people. You see this in the gospel, that Jesus modeled a prayerful presence with people, whether it was a Samaritan woman or the widow at Nair or the rich young ruler or Nicodemus or his disciples. He seemed to be engaged in the lives of the people that came to him. He delighted in them. He wanted to know them. He seemed into the beauty in the men and women who were created in the image of God. He genuinely cared for them. And Sabbath invites us into play. The word chosen by the Greek fathers to describe the unity of the Trinity is this word that basically describes that they're dancing around. Creation and life are in a sense God's gift of a playground to us. And whether it's through sports or dance or games or looking at old family pictures or visiting a museum or playing games with your kids or watching a movie together, delighting is a part of Sabbath. And the fourth part of Sabbath is contemplate. The final quality of biblical Sabbath, of course, is the contemplation of God. Scripture says the Sabbath is always holy to God. Pondering on the love of God remains the central focus of our Sabbath. Throughout Jewish and Christian history, Sabbath has included worship with God's people where we feast on his presence, the reading and study of his word, and in silence before God. Every Sabbath also serves as a taste of the glorious eternal party of heaven where there is music and food and beauty that awaits us when we see him face to face. On every Sabbath, we experience a sampling of something greater that awaits us. Our short earthly lives, a maximum maybe 80, 90 years, are put into perspective as we look forward to the day when God's kingdom will come in all of its fullness and we will enter into eternal rest in God's perfect presence where we will experience his splendor and greatness and beauty and excellence and glory that's far beyond anything you and I have ever experienced here on this earth. Friends, you and I, we need the Sabbath. We need to rest. We need to communicate in how we live that we're not in control of our lives, but God is, and so we can rest trusting that he will take care of us. When you don't, you burn out really fast, and you sit on the sidelines, and you don't do the things that God's called you to do. And then you will, when you sit on the sidelines and you sit, what ends up happening is you'll look around and complain about everyone else that's doing stuff and you'll bicker. And you'll become useless for the kingdom. In fact, you'll become a hindrance to the kingdom. You need to be able to rest. It's a gift from God that you and I desperately need. God gives us permission to step away from work, from busyness, simply enjoy him and his gifts. It's hardly a burdensome gift. But almost everyone I know looks scared when we talk about it. And that's usually an indication that we need this more than we realize. Let me give you a few suggestions on how to build a practice of Sabbath. Number one, begin 
to build a regular pattern of rest in your life. If it's too hard to jump to rest for an entire day, begin with an hour or a part of a day. Disengage from work. Begin small. Let go of anything that seems like an obligation to you. If you feel like you need to do it, like you have to answer that email or you have to run that errand or you have to do that chore, don't do it. Just rest. No obligation while resting. Instead, pursue activities that renew you. Pursue things that refresh you. Go for a walk. Visit with friends. Play games with your kids. Pursue a hobby. Pursue activities and people that make you feel more alive. Number three, avoid pseudo rest. There are some activities that aren't rest. They're distractions. They leave us less rested than before. I found that most activities, things like social media or mindless media consumption, don't make me feel more alive than before. Avoid them when you're resting. And as you grow in your ability to let go of work and pursue activities that bring you rest, expand the practice. Aim to build the practice of rest so you can do it for an entire day. Be patient. Keep going when you fail. Build your capacity for rest. Few habits will make more difference in your lives than this one. He wants you not just to do. He wants you to be. God isn't happy with you just doing, doing, doing. He didn't save you for your potential and all the things you could do for him. He saved you because of you. So be. Accept his gift as an acknowledgement of your limits and as a gift of his love. Rest. Be present. Be free. Number two, give generously. Money flows to what we value. At least that's what we tend to think. But Jesus flips the head on this teaching. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart is. Our heart follows our money. When we spend money on something, it changes our emotion and our affections. How we spend our money doesn't just reflect our values. It changes our values. It changes our desires. And in light of this, Jesus himself is very clear. He says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust will destroy and thieves will break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust will destroy and thieves cannot break in or steal. Jesus says, invest your money toward needs and ministries that make an eternal difference. And that begins with your local church community. No ministry is more ordinary and yet more important than your local church. Friends, if you consider this to be your home church, plug in. Give regularly. Give joyfully. Give generously. Give not so that because you're giving somehow is making us go. That's not true. You're, if you're not giving, God will provide from somewhere else. Giving isn't for the church. Giving isn't for me. Giving is because you acknowledge that God is the source of your life. It is you saying, God, thank you for providing. How much should you give? C.S. Lewis gives the best advice. He says, I don't believe one can settle on how much we ought to give. I'm afraid that the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts and luxuries and amusements is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we're probably giving away too little. If our charities do not at all pinch us or hamper us, I think I should say they are too small. There ought to be things that we should like to do and cannot do because our charity's expenditures expenditure excludes them. Give in a way that honors Jesus. In our end, our giving should follow the example of Jesus. Second Corinthians says it this way, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that even though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that by his poverty you and I, we can become rich. Not only did Jesus give up the peace, joy, and glory of heaven, but he took on a life of poverty so that you and I could benefit. The gospel frees us to follow his example. So here are some ways to build a habit of generosity. Number one, see everything as God's. See everything as God's. The fact that you have a job today isn't because of your skills or your talents. It's because God gave it to you. 
The fact that you have money in your bank account isn't because you are wise in saving. It's because God blessed you with it. The fact that you own a home is because God was gracious and kind to you. See everything as God's. In his book, Master Your Money, the first principle that Ron Blue mentions is that God owns it all. When we realize that everything belongs to God, it's a lot easier to give it away. When we realize that everything belongs to God, it's a lot easier to go to God and God, say, God, you gave me this much income. How do you want, what do you want me to do with it? It's yours. Help me to be a steward of it. Number one. Number two, get your spending and debt out of, under control. A reason a lot of us aren't able to give generously is because we're in debt and we're getting into more debt and we have no margin. Tackling that problem takes courage, a plan, support, and time. And there are a ton of great resources out there to help you, and you will feel better knowing that you're not paying a credit card company. Get your debt under control. Number three, start small. Assess your resources and ask, what would a generous amount be for me to give right now? Don't wait until you have money to be generous. The reality is you'll never start. Right? I mean, if you get more money, you'll get more expenses, and then you won't give there. Start where you are. If it's a dollar, it's a dollar. If it's five dollars, it's five dollars. God isn't interested in what you give. God is interested in your heart. Right? He loves a cheerful giver. Follow the same habits that we talked about for building habits. Start small. Focus on progress, not perfection, and keep going even when you fail. Begin today. Don't wait. And number four, set a goal. I find a long-term vision helpful especially when my immediate situation is challenging. I don't know if I'll ever make it, but I love the idea of reverse tithing, where I get to keep 10% and then be able to give away 90%. I don't know if I'll ever get there, but that's a fascinating concept for me. Set a goal. Work toward it. Start where you are and grow from there. Speaking of tithing, some people think that tithing is an Old Testament practice that no longer applies to us today. Others of you see it as a um, if that bar was set for 10% for those who didn't know Jesus, shouldn't the bar be higher for us? Shouldn't we be saying, God, how can I be a blessing to others? How can I give in a way that others are blessed and encouraged? And that, it doesn't necessarily have to be money to the church. Are you opening your homes to invite people in and sharing a meal? Are you taking people out where it costs you something? And you say, I'm doing this because I love God and I love people. Develop the habit of generosity. Start where you are. Ask God to shape your heart as he shapes your use of your money. Number three, serve others. Listen to these following scriptures. John 13, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Mark 10, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all. First Peter, each of you have received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. The Apostle Paul compares us to the body where each part of us has a role to play. The church needs you to play your role. Without your contribution, the church will miss out. And that isn't easy. It runs against our natural selfishness. I'd rather be served than serve. And even though this is contrary to this example of Jesus, it also runs against the way that many of our churches are structured. If the extent of our involvement in church is sitting in rows, we won't see much of a need to serve. But friends, all of you are needed. You're all part of the body of Jesus. Not only do you rob the church when you don't serve, but you disobey Scripture and you rob yourself. Studies show that serving God and others is correlated with the characteristics of a mature believer. The way to begin serving is to just start. Spiritual gifts can help, but it's so much easier to just get going. Pitch in where it's needed. Ask others for feedback. Allow them to identify where your eyes light up, where it's most effective. Some jobs just need doing. Don't delay. Growth isn't about maturity. It's about service. So here's some ways to get started. Look for opportunities to serve, both in the church and in the community. Don't wait to be asked. Find ways where you can serve. Number two, focus on these two things, what you do well 
and what you gives you passion. You don't need to take a spiritual test for that. You know what you do well. You know what you enjoy. Serve there. Don't become focused on finding the right service opportunity. Whenever possible, just pitch in, serve where needed. Number four, ask others for feedback. Ask others to help you. Say, hey, where do you think I could serve well? Where do you think my, I can get plugged in? Ask them for feedback. All right, next thing, share the gospel. The word evangelism is a terrible following. He said, I find evangelism hard. The problem with being an evangelist is that people assume that I, evangelism for me is effortless, but I don't find it easy, and I never have. For me, telling people about Jesus has often been nerve-wracking, and yet at the same time, it's been the most joyful. I shared about this lady, Rosaria Butterfield, a few weeks ago. Um, she wrote a book called The Gospel Comes with the Key. And in her book, she shares about the story of a pastor by the name of Ken Smith. Pastor Smith wrote a letter to a writer um, of an article who wrote a hostile letter against a Christian ministry. And in his letter, he didn't argue with her. He just simply asked questions. And he gently invited her to think in ways that she hadn't thought before. And when the writer called him to talk to him, the pastor invites her over for dinner. She arrives, and they begin to cultivate a friendship. They listen to each other. They dialogue. She didn't feel like a project. She felt like a friend. And the pastor never even invited her to church. She just learned that it was safe to explore Christianity with him. So much I loved about that story. First of all, he engages with someone who's hostile, but he isn't antagonistic. He respected her, asked her questions. It was unexpected that the writer didn't even know what to do with that. When we discover someone who's hostile to Christianity, it's an opportunity for us not to freak out and panic, but instead to engage thoughtfully and respectfully. Second, he invites her into her home. I've never been more convinced that the key to evangelism in the 21st century is one word, hospitality. It's not mass crusades. It's not passing tracts out on the road. It's hospitality. It's just inviting someone into your home. It's just saying, hey, I want to get to know you. Come hang out with us. Have dinner with us. Let's, let's just get to know each other. Increasingly, the most strategic turf to which to engage unbelievers with the good news of Jesus will be the turf of your own homes. When's the last time you've had an unbeliever in your home? When's the last time you just invited a neighbor and said, hey, let's just talk. Let's just get to know each other. And this shouldn't come as a surprise because look at the ministry of Jesus. You see a lot of food. You see a lot of hospitality. It is the key to sharing our faith is engaging and inviting. And notice, Ken doesn't also stick to the script. He didn't start by sharing the gospel. He didn't invite her to church. He didn't treat her like a project. He intentionally made space for her to talk about Jesus. Don't get me wrong. I'm all about sharing the great news of the gospel with people. And I'm I'm all about inviting people to church. But that shouldn't be your ultimate goal. Don't artificially pressure people and make them projects. All right, I've tried to invite them, and I'm going to give up and move on to the next one. They can see right through you. Love people. Embrace people. When I think about evangelism as sharing the gospel with people who don't want to hear it, it clams me up. It freaks me out. But when I think about sharing the gospel of extending hospitality over food, asking good questions, praying, sensing what the Holy Spirit is doing, there's something exciting about that. There's something genuine about that. It's something that all of us can do. You know, we have several folks here they're serving on campus we have a campus right down the street that has thousands and thousands of international students who for years will be here and they will never get invited into a home here what an opportunity for us to just simply say hey you're on thanksgiving break why don't you come over to our house for thanksgiving connect with these guys who are serving on campus and say do you know students are not going invite them genuinely care for them Embrace them. You know what the number one argument with international students are about why they want to leave America so quickly? In the years that they're here, no one has ever invited them to their home. 
And so they leave here hating the country. What an opportunity for us to say, you know, we're not just extending love to you for the sake of extending love to you. We're extending love to you because this is what Jesus did to us. He invited us in. We're inviting you in, and we want you to experience the love of Jesus in how in us sharing a meal with you. So some practical ways, building habits of sharing the gospel. Extend hospitality to people who aren't following Jesus. Lean into these relationships, especially with people who seem far away from God. Make them a regular part of your life. Invite them into your home. Invite them into your community. Become friends with them. Number two, ask good questions. Be respectful. Listen more than you talk. Number three, pray regularly for the people who are resistant and curious. Ask God to work in their lives. Who are you praying for today that doesn't know Jesus? Refuse to see people as projects. Love them lavishly, regardless of whether they follow Jesus or don't follow Jesus. You remember the thief on the cross? He died. He came to Jesus right before he died. There might be some people in your life that you might spend years investing. And there might be one random day that they will encounter Jesus. He isn't calling you to make converts. He's calling you to be faithful. Be faithful. Don't feel like you have to follow a script. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And ask the Holy Spirit to give you courage to speak clearly and openly about the gospel when the time is right. God uses people just like you and I to spread the good news of his gospel to people who've never heard it before. All right, last thing. Look after your body. The gospel is meant to change every aspect of our lives. Looking after our bodies is an important part of our stewardship before God for so many reasons. We're embodied beings, and we need to discover a high view of our body as an important part of what it means to be human. Because we belong to God, our bodies have become his property and his residence, and we are responsible to look after them. You cannot function well in other areas of your life, including spiritually, if you don't take care of yourself. There's a passage in 1 Timothy 4 that says, Train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds the promise of eternal life and also for life to come. Now, some people have misunderstood that and say, only focus on the spiritual, ignore the body. But that's not what the passage is saying. It says that bodily training is of some value. It's not as important as godliness, which will matter a lot longer than your physical health, but you still need to take care of yourself. Your bodies matter. It's important that you develop habits that will help you look after your body. So a few ways to start. Number one, develop good eating habits. The Bible addresses that this is a spiritual issue. Proverbs 23, if you want to look at it. Proverbs 23, 19 and 21. Eat slowly. Enjoy food more. Enjoy the food that's been put before you. Eat with other folks so that you're fellowshipping and even your meals become sacred. Move around. Take a walk. Engage in an activity you enjoy. Play sports. Hang, exercise. Start where you are. Build from there. Number three, get enough sleep. There are a few things as theological as sleep. David Murray said that, and I think he's right. Sleep reveals what we believe about God. I just said this earlier. We sleep because we know that God doesn't. Because God has given you important work, and he wants you to steward. Because God has given you important work, he wants you to steward your body well. So get sleep that you need and trust God to complete what you're unable to do. You need to rest. If you're unhealthy because you didn't take care of your body and you become sitting on the sidelines, you become ineffective for the kingdom. Take care of yourselves. There's some really, really good books if you want to dive deeper into this. There's one that's called Full. Food, Jesus, and the Battle for Satisfaction is a really, really good book. 
another one called Reset, Living a Grace-Paced Life in a Burnout Culture. These are really good resources if you really want to dive into this. Let me conclude. I've given you three core habits, reading the Bible, reading and listening to the Bible, praying, going to church, five supporting habits. If you try to implement these all at once, you will fail. You will burn out. Don't even start on these supporting habits till you've begun starting the practice of the core habits. Keep working on those. These habits can wait until you're ready to address them. Once you have the core habits working well, start to focus on one of these supporting habits at a time. Pick one. Use the same guidelines that we talked about for learning the core habits. Start small. Shape your environment. Use triggers and rewards. Pursue progress instead of perfection. Wipe the slate clean when you fail. What you do consistently matters more than what you do irregularly. When we work these habits into our lives, they begin to work on us. They will put us in paths of God's grace where we sense God working in our lives day in and day out. Build habits, and they will build you. A few weeks ago, in one of our passages, we looked at 2 Peter, where we were reminded that God's divine power has given us everything that we needed for life and godliness. Friends, God has given you what you need so that you can grow in your walk with Jesus. As we close out the series, let me just say a few final things. Number one, practice the right disciplines with the right goals. The goal is Jesus. Pursuing intimacy with Jesus and become conforming, conforming into the image of Jesus. To put it more clearly, the result of you practicing these habits is that you are with Jesus and you become like Jesus. The goal is that your life is completely changed. When you get to heaven, God is not going to ask you how many times you read the Bible. God's not going to ask you if you prayed three times a day. But he will be interested in if your life was daily being transformed into the image of Jesus. Are you growing? Are you becoming more like Jesus? Are you becoming more into the likeness of your Savior? Are you falling in love with him? Number two, practice the disciplines the right way. Practice these habits the right way. Emphasize the person and work of Jesus in each one. Through them, lean on, graze upon, enjoy who Jesus is and what he has done. Let your soul be rested by the truths of the gospel. Engage in the habits given by God in Scripture so that you are continually shown your need for Jesus and the infinite supply of grace and mercy that's found to you in Jesus. Bro, my prayer is that through this series that you would just begin to build habits where you and I will become more and more like Jesus. My prayer is that we would grow and mature, that we would be what Jesus has called us to be because when we're doing that, it makes a difference in our lives and it makes a difference in our community. Would you pray with me?